Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Eisloffel with the Nebraska State Historical Society. I'd like to welcome you to the Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Nebraska uh, Museum of Nebraska History on the third Thursday of every month. A uh, detailed schedule of this series, uh, as well as all of our other activities, uh, programs and services can be found on our website at www.nebraskahistory.org. Uh, I also want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Uh, their financial support allows us to videotape and broadcast these programs on public access television. As I say, I'm Paul Eisloffel. I'm the curator of visual and audio collections here at the Nebraska State Historical Society. Uh, to ease into this, uh, I'd like to go back about a decade or so. Back in 1997, the Library of Congress issued a report on the state of American television and video preservation. In it, the library declared that the products of local TV broadcasting were not only valuable as reflections of American history and culture in general, but as vital documentation of a local community's heritage. But the report also decried the fact that many of these products, particularly the film and video that captured much of the local news, are at tremendous risk. Uh, if it still exists at all, much of it is in danger of deterioration or worse, destruction. Now this report lit a fire under both the broadcasting and the archival communities, and I'm happy to say that in the relative few years uh, since that report came out, great strides have been made to uh, save local TV's heritage. Here at the Nebraska State Historical Society, for example, we participated in a national project that produced this publication, Local Television, A Guide to Saving Our Heritage, and just this past year, we acquired the footage of KMTV in Omaha, bringing the number of stations represented in our collections to five. KMTV, KETV, also in Omaha, KOLN in Lincoln, KGIN in Grand Island, and KHAS in Hastings. Now, as with all things preserved in archives all over the world, these materials now live to see another day. And that day has come, at least for some of the choice TV materials in our collections and some that we don't have yet. That's thanks to today's speaker, Bill Kelly. Now, you may not know it to look at him, but Bill's already had a long and distinguished career <laughs> as a media producer and a broadcast journalist. He's currently executive producer for news and public affairs at Nebraska Educational Television. If you're an ETV, wide. Well, you have Bill to thank for that. Not only does he oversee the innovative show's production, but he created it back in 1992, and it continues to be one of the most watched and highly regarded programs on the network. Bill has also produced several doc, uh, topical documentaries for NET. No doubt you've enjoyed those as well. His latest, though, is what we're here to talk about today. Don't touch that dial is a story that Bill is particularly well suited to tell. Bill? Thank you. I, I, I guess I get to explain why I'm particularly well suited to tell the story. The, I, I, I'm in the business of, of television because I grew up with television. And like probably many of you spent probably too many hours in front of the television growing up. Um, and I've always been fascinated by it. I, I, I got into journalism n not even so much uh, because of, of the idea of, of covering stories, but because watching the nightly news, back when the nightly news covered news, uh, it was really cool to be part of, you know, the watching, watching uh, the space flights. And, and being at the national conventions. Now, I, I saw that as, as, as a ticket to, to see a lot of really cool things. 
I've been very fortunate that it's that it's worked out that way. Um, with joining us today is, is Jim Underwood. Jim's the uh, videographer and editor for this program. Give a little wave there, Jim, if you want to be associated. Um, you'll you'll uh, the 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 handiwork you see here is is uh, may not represent Jim's best work because we're using so much archival material. Once you see the entire program, when we're dealing primarily in this case with, as Jim has pointed out more than once to me, little tiny fragments of 10 seconds here and 20 seconds there of what's left over from this uh, archival history of the early days, it's, uh, he's done a remarkable job. Omaha and Nebraska have a really unique place in the history of broadcasting nationally. It's everyone grew up with these local programs, but I think people that grew up in their local markets sometimes don't realize how far ahead their local markets were. Local television actually started, uh, they began thinking about it here in Nebraska in the mid-1940s. Uh, there were a couple of, of visionary uh, broadcast entities, WOW Radio in Omaha and KMA Radio in Shenandoah, Iowa, that saw Nebraska and Omaha in particular as a really good early television market. <laughs> they were on almost parallel tracks to try and develop TV stations at about the same time. And as it turned out, when they went on the air in uh, the f uh, fall of uh, uh, 1949, uh, they were within just a few days of going on the air uh, at the same time. Extremely unusual to have a city Omaha's size at that point with two television stations. Almost unheard of. Um, but it was because there were these radio stations that saw a financial future in it that, uh, that, that drove this. Um, if for almost everybody in the room, the thing that you're going to remember uh, are uh, there, there are a couple of key programs that, that are going to resonate with you. I'm going to have Paul go to uh, uh, clip number three up here because I have a feeling everybody here is going to have a little, a little moment here. Hi there, I'm Pozo the Clown and it's time for Circus Fun and Adventure, so stay tuned! <laughs> Good to have you with us today. You know, we're going to have all kinds of fun. We got boys and girls in our peanut gallery, and look at the boys and girls. And we got cartoons, and we got riddles, and we got candy, and we got balloons, and we're going to have all kinds of fun. We have balloon fights and all those things. So, whatever you do, be sure you stick around for Bozo the Clown and all the circus friends and fun and adventure. Will you do that? Local television. Uh, the Bozo the Clown, Romper Room, you might remember, uh, a couple other kids' programs were local programs. There were national franchises, though. Uh, there was a different Bozo the Clown and a different Miss Jean, Miss Shirley, Miss Eunice, whatever, in, in markets all over the country. At, because what people may not recognize is and it's what one of our uh, historian we talked to in this program refers to as hyperlocalism, which, boy, there's a good academic term. <laughs> hyperlocalism was being able to actually have Bozo the Clown or Miss Jean or Calamity Kate or Sheriff Bill say hi to a kid who's sitting in front of his television set right now. And it was that local, and we will never ever see that again other than on cable access programming right now probably but it's it's a, it's remarkable that local television was that local at the time the 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 clip you saw is actually for as grainy and black and white as it looks uh, pretty sophisticated television for for its time um, this was KOLN's Bozo the Clown by the way and uh, uh, you actually have to back up a few more years. We, I, we haven't been able to actually get a, a date on, on what year that was, but it was probably uh, mid-50s, late 50s. Uh, when, you, when they first started going on the air in 1949 in Omaha, um, there was not even a network cable from AT&T that reached as far as Omaha. It stopped at St. Louis. 
And so everything had to happen one of two ways. Either it had to be local, and there was a lot of local programming, or they had to get a can of film from New York City that had been shot off a television monitor, no videotape, had to be shot off a television monitor back in New York. And that same can of film would go to St. Louis, and then St. Louis would show it, and they'd send it to Minneapolis, and then Minneapolis would show it, and then it would finally get to Omaha, or you know, some route or another, if you were lucky enough to get the can of film or not. So while people were buying television sets at the time, they may have been looking forward to seeing Milton Berle or, or uh, George Burns and Gracie Allen, but there was no guarantee it was going to be showing up on Channel 6 or Channel 3 that night. So they had to have local programming available. <laughs> Which brings us to the first day of, of programming on, on each of these stations. Both stations started to getting their engineering in line quite a, quite a few months uh, ahead, even, even years ahead of time. Uh, WOW, and this was, this was fascinating for me, it's, it's a pretty quick part of the program. WOW actually bought a whole bunch of broadcast equipment, took it over to Creighton University and said, congratulations, you have a broadcast television department. <laughs> and, and this was a windfall for uh, uh, the, the folks over there. They were already interested in this, in this field and the, 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 the Jesuit uh, professor who was, who was doing it was delighted. And they literally camped out there for an extended period of time practicing television programs. Nobody thought any of this stuff had been preserved. Uh, one, of the, one of the nicer pieces of, of basement digging research is we did find some photographs of this and, uh, and one short film clip of a, of a program being, being rehearsed. But they were literally making it up as they went along, trying to figure out how the equipment worked, what kind of makeup, what kind of lighting. None of this had been documented really to any degree, even though television had already been underway in, in New York for a while. The, uh, one of the programs that, that came out that they were rehearsing uh, at the time was a program called WOW Calling. It was a very popular radio program at the time. Uh, music, skits, and the like. Um, this will be clip number one, by the way. And, uh, and it ended up being pretty much a radio program that you stuck a television camera in front of. And, and the result was uh, something that showed up on the very first day of, of uh, television in, uh, in Nebraska. W-O-W calling. If you hate to do dishes, you'll love that draft. Draft, America's favorite suds for dishes, presents W.O.W. Calling with the drafters, Betty Cox, Keats Mahoney, the Gold and Silver Trio, Wranglers, the Mystery Man Question, he's Ray Olson, he's Ross Baker, this is the Midwest's biggest noon hour show, W.O.W. Calling. And the drafters open our show this bright and sunshiny noon hour with a convivial suggestion, let's have another one. going men? Well, friends, we've received a lot of mail already concerning the continuation of this noon hour on television. And while we can't make any statement yet, there is one letter that I just had to bring to the studio this noon. 
I'll bet it's the one from the Springfield, Nebraska family, the one from the Metzger. That's right. It's from Mr. and Mrs. Herb Metzger and Barbara and Rex and Skeets. It's mainly addressed to you. To me? Yeah. Like my stuff, huh? Well, judge for yourself. I'll quote. Please keep on with W.O.W. calling on television. We and the children like the whole noon hour. We like Skeets Mahoney so well that we named our new Cocker Spaniel after him. Our dog is so cute, and we love him so. Oh, no! Naming a dog after me. Now, Skeets, they said the dog was very cute. I think that's a real compliment. You should be happy. Why didn't they name it Fido or Prince? <laughs> now, please, Betty, don't stir him up anymore. Well, I'll tell you now. Sit up straight, Skeetsy. Roll over. I'll tear out your commercial. Ray, Ray, don't excite him. You may quote me as saying... Ah! Ah! Tom, Tommy, you don't need to sp pick on Skeets either. You get ready for your number while Ray talks about something new and different. It's entirely new, different. It's Procter & Gamble's great new draft, America's most sensational new dishwashing suds. New draft has two big new benefits. Know what they are? Well, first, new draft is packed with extra power, 40% more dishwashing power for the fastest, easiest dishwashing ever. And second, new draft has wonderful new beauty mildness. You can actually see its extra dishwashing power. When you try Draft, notice the richer suds, how grease simply vanishes, how many more dishes new Draft washes. And that's not all, ladies. Every time you use Draft, you'll see your dishes shine, even without wiping. But wait till you feel Draft's new beauty mildness. New Draft leaves your hands softer and whiter. It's one of the mildest suds in the world. The dishwater feels cleaner, too, and your hands feel wonderful. Thanks to Draft's new beauty mildness. Try Draft. Compare it with any other suds. Great new draft. 40% more dishwashing power, plus new beauty mildness for your hands. Betty Cox, our own draft girl, and Skeets Mahoney, the idol of the best cocker spaniel crowd. Join up for Drop Day, Little Darling, Drop Day. Now gather around and listen to me in this sure piece in the gear, see? Come on, Clem. Aha! Every mountain song I hear starts me crying in my beer. Little darling's one gal I will never miss. Uh -huh. Cause I'm fed up to the ears and I'd give three rousing cheers. They'd only sing a song that goes like this here. Drop, drop dead, dead, little darling, darling drop, drop dead. dead. I need you like a hole in the head. Get I'm lost and get you gone. I'm no longer your Don Juan. Get red, little, little darling, darling, drop dead. How'd you get so dead? Burn Doug. Oh, just fortunate, I guess. Well, go on and sing, Al. Uh, you've been hanging around me now for I can't recall how long, and it's time I told you all the told you truth. Oh, tell me truth. I can't stand you anymore, and I'm showing you the door. You've had your day, and hear what you can do. <laughs> drop dead, little darling, drop dead. I need you like a hole in the head. I get lost and get you gone. I'm no longer your Don Juan. Drop dead, little darling. Drop dead. Now this here piece in the gear, see? And this is the last you'll hear of me. Cause you've been hearing what I said. Little darling. Drop dead. You know, I, I have to tell you something, in, in listening to, to your reaction, you know, Jim and I are sitting in the editing booth and we're saying, God, you know, how, how long can we let these things go and still have them be interesting and stuff like that? And here's, here's this long, and I'm sitting up there going, oh my God, are these people going to walk out on this? And, and this, what's fascinating is people love watching this stuff, no matter how horrible the entertainment <laughs> content is. <laughs> That it's 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 so it's so foreign to what we're familiar with now that it's it's literally like like you know a time machine or visiting another country. A, a, a couple of a couple of things that that I think you may have caught on to. One is keep in mind this is live television. This may not be as live as you think. I'll get back to that. Um, this is live television, and so when you're watching the draft commercial and all of a sudden stuff is spewing out of the sink. Hey, you know, it was, it was one take, one camera that they had available to us. One camera at the product, one camera at the sink. And somebody at the other point is swinging around to uh, go back to the talent uh, at the podium at the end of the commercial. So there were, there were entire shows like this that they would do with two cameras. And that was it. Um, the clips that you'll see of these programs 
and it's it's part of part of what Paul was talking about about how how precious this material is. I didn't realize until we were into this project for a little while that an awful lot of what we're seeing here may or may not have actually been on the air. There was a fair amount of material that was created especially by WOW to create a sample film for advertisers to show them what the programs would be like because you know what? They couldn't go home and watch. They didn't have TV sets yet. This stuff may not have even been on the air. The two clips that you will see that were actually on the air, Johnny Carson's program and the Martha Bolson uh, cooking program, the only reason those exist in their entirety is because those were the Christmas morning programs. And they did them on film for that day. Everything else was live and none of it, none of it was preserved because it was too expensive or they just didn't fit, the, there wasn't any need to. You know, the, well, they weren't going to repeat the Bolson show that day uh, like they do on cable these days, so why save it? So it's gone. It's gone. So we have these reenactments or these test runs or in a very few cases as, as samples of what television was actually, actually like at the time. Um, with the programs that went on the air, they found out pretty quickly. WOW Calling didn't even last a year. They, they just, as, as one of the writers who we interview in the program says, was great on radio, couldn't quite figure out why it didn't work on television. Well, frankly, I think you can probably figure out why it wasn't working on television. You know, even, even for, even though there wasn't much to compare it with, you know, it just didn't feel right. And it wasn't until television stations began developing local personalities that people could relate to, which seems pretty obvious to us right now, um, that's, those are the ones that, that people started watching. Um, there, were some, there were some formats that ended up working out quite well. What, we're, what you're gonna see is, seems pretty basic, but you know, for television, it was new at the time. That's uh, clip number two, please. It's a program called Coffee Counter, brought to you by Butternut Coffee. And uh, the gentleman uh, that, that is hosting, uh, for a little historical heads up, would later become the president and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company, a gentleman named Don Keogh. <laughs> Hi there, everybody. Yes, it is 12.15 and time once again for you and I to have our little regular visit on the coffee counter. You know, each day, as part of WOWTV's Great Noon Hour Show, we have 15 minutes where we drink a little coffee and meet a lot of very interesting people. And as always, we spend a portion of that 15 minutes talking to our charming guest hostess for the day. And today being Creighton's Day on the coffee counter, we have a very lovely gal who uh, is going to school down Creighton now. What year are you in down there? I'm a freshman now. And would you tell us your name? And my name is Leslie Noel. Leslie Noel? Mm -hmm. You know, no? just like Christmas. Just like Christmas, I see. Well, Leslie, could you tell us just a little bit in our television audience uh, what you'd like to be uh, when, you, uh, when you get out of school? Well, I'd like to be a social worker, Don. That's what my ambition has always been, you, you know, to work with the poor people. Uh -huh. Are you majoring in yes, sociology? Yes, I am. I see. Well, now, what uh, extracurricular activities uh, you have down there? ...with uh, Cecilia Shia from China. And uh, by golly, we just can't leave our own USA out of the picture, can we? So mm -hmm. we're going to come over here, Margie. You bashful? Right here. Okay, Margie. <laughs> we're going to talk to Margie uh, Donahue, who is a student too, aren't you, Margie? Yes, I am, Don. Out of Duchenne. And Before I understand. you start talking, can I compliment you on the good coffee? You certainly can. Is it this delicious every day? Why, it's even better some days, Margie. And incidentally, while we're talking about that coffee, I've got a surprise for you. At the end of this program, I'm going to give you a large pound can of this very same coffee right here, so you can take it home. Take it home to China with you when you go. Oh, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Cecilia. Well, now, uh, as I say, we've talked about other lands, uh, and you're still a student, and I understand that you've got a little notion that you want to travel. I certainly do, Dad. When you get out of school. Now, where would you like to go? Well, I'd like to go to France and Switzerland and Italy. Um, you've been here now for a couple of years in the United States. I wonder if you can make some comparisons 
Now, that's kind of a broad and general question, but I mean some comparisons of living at home and here in, in Omaha, in USA. Oh, well done. Um, definitely, at home, I feel much better. When I say that, I mean I'm referring to the racial problem here. That's the worst thing that a person can experience, you know. Is that right, Bill? That's now, right. Bill, uh, back in British Andres, you don't have that problem at all. Oh, no, right? we don't have that at all. You can go anywhere and go out with whom you please, and so buy houses, buy homes anywhere, and so we have never been... Well, have you gotten quite interested in the racial problem since you've been oh, here? Oh, I certainly have. I certainly have, because um, it was rather shocking three days after I came here and came face to face with this so-called Jim Crow, you know, and... Um, Oh, in, the, in the South Line. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, right here. Right Is it here. right here in right Omaha? In the South Line in Omaha. We don't have to go way down south for that. Is that right? <laughs> well, Bill, uh, do you, have you noted any improvements since you've been here? Do you think that there, that barrier, as you say, is breaking down? Well, I think it is, but very, very little. Mm -hmm. very well, very now, little. what suggestion do you have, Bill? Yes, Bill, I'm sorry. I wish we could talk about this for hours, but doggone us to see you. It happens every day. We've got to get off this. Uh, microphone and off this television set so that we can have W.O.W. Calling come your way. We think that's one of the greatest June Hour programs in television. This is Don Keogh saying uh, goodbye now and uh, we'll be coming your way with some other nice guests and a nice cup of coffee. Won't you join us tomorrow? Goodbye. Um, in, a, in an interview uh, uh, Don Keogh did uh, in the 80s that's featured in the program, he points out that uh, uh, Television did something very subtle. The example you saw here was probably probably pretty blatant in, in coming up with, with kind of, a, I th think, a pretty surprising social issue for 1949. Um, but Don points out that it's simply the act of having a black person on television was kind of a statement in itself. And, and that you could do that television opened doors to allow for that, that uh, you might have a, uh, uh, somebody from a different ethnic group on radio and you'd never know it, nor would anybody ever point out, we're talking with a black man now. <laughs> television, it was just there. And so it actually gave permission to start talking about things that really didn't get talked about in, in, in radio very often. The, uh, the WOW noon lineup was, was kind of interesting because they, this wasn't 24-hour television as we have now. There was nothing on, nothing on television until noon. They would broadcast the test pattern, which an amazing number of people watched. <laughs> hey, it was, it was a miracle, as a, more than one person points out, and then pop. All of a sudden, the first program would show up. It, that was five minutes of weather, uh, which looks amazingly like five minutes of weather today. <laughs> it's, except it's a guy with a, with a magic marker instead of uh, electronic graphics. Uh, five minutes of uh, farm news uh, with, uh, with a guy named Mal Hansen, and, uh, and then Coffee Counter, and then WOW uh, rounded out that hour. Um, the, the afternoon program uh, the, was, uh, afternoon was dominated by, by women's programming on, on almost any local station. There was the very early understanding, a carryover from radio, that women were a key audience. They were doing the shopping, they were doing the cooking, they were doing the cleaning, they were home and they were watching TV at the time as well. And so the first, uh, the first broadcasters were also frequently women as well. And uh, uh, there was a great deal of, of conversation and camaraderie and rapport with housewives at the time and, and the hosts of the women program. Uh, a woman named, named Martha Bolson uh, that some of you may recognize uh, uh, dominated the, the afternoon schedule. Um, <clears throat> the other program that, uh, that popped up was uh, Johnny Carson's afternoon program. Another kind of odd bit of scholarship was everyone has referred to Johnny Carson's program over the years as the squirrel cage. Carson always referred to it that way himself. 
And I had a very difficult time. We got some early TV guides and we were trying to find out, okay, you know, when was this thing on? Nobody had ever said that. And when did it actually start? And we couldn't find it in any of the TV guides. And finally, there was a, a little reference in one of the TV guides that at uh, 3.30 in the afternoon, there's a program called Family Matinee and with host John Carson. And it turns out that Squirrel Cage was a segment of Family Matinee. And there's a, there's a, a clip in this, in this show where, where Carson is introducing his show. He goes, yeah, welcome to uh, uh, Family Matinee or Squirrel Cage. It goes by a bunch of names that I don't think he liked the name Family Matinee. <laughs> And so he just didn't use it and, and refused to use it for the rest of his life. Um, our, our, our clip number five is, uh, is a little clip of the John Carson Christmas show. And he said to me, what am I going to do? He said, in New York, a guy's got a one hour show. He's got 50 people to help him. And I don't have it. He said, I'm all alone. My name's Johnny Carson. And this program is called The Squirrel's Nest, sometimes family matinee, and uh, sometimes quite a few other things. And he filled the time between short films, cartoons, sometimes local talent. The holly green, the ivy green, the prettiest picture you've ever seen is Christmas in Killarney. There was no budget, literally no budget for it, except to pay for uh, the people who were doing the show, and Carson too. Uh, but in terms of a budget for production, it just wasn't there. We had to go out and scrounge. We'd scrounge up people who were in town, get them to come in. How are you doing, Al? We had an invited studio, not an invited studio audience, probably a forced audience. We went out and corralled people off the street. We set them on folding chairs uh, in the studio, and we started. Yeah, I'll take a break. Short of a little bit, no. A segment of family matinee called The Squirrel's Nest highlighted Carson's comedy. Jingle bell! I might have done a little magic at that time, maybe some ventriloquism. And then we would start the turtle race, which I thought was wonderful, because you could kill, as I said, 10 minutes with it. And they would bet on it. Give him another piece of cake. You want a piece of cake, Bob? Give him, yeah. give him a piece of cake. This show didn't look like the other programs. Those were radio just put in front of a camera. Johnny Carson recognized that people were not just listening. They sat down and they watched. He had ideas all of his own, and he, there weren't, weren't very many people of his caliber available. The world's in quite a botched up situation, December, Christmas Day, 1950. And we certainly hope that by next Christmas, in 1951, that peace on earth and goodwill toward men will certainly be the thing. I think they knew he was a deeper thinker, but he I rarely mean, showed that. He never wanted to show that. He really very rarely wanted to show his inner feelings. I think Johnny covered most of it up with, with comedy. And I think he was there at the right time. W.O.W. was the kind of station where it let him do those sort of things. Well, what I like about television, I'm still doing on this show, The Tonight Show, what basically I did in Omaha 35 years ago. Um, we'll see you next Wednesday on Squirrel's Nest. Till then, this is Johnny Carson saying goodbye, everyone. And, wh and when you see them literally back to back like that, boy, you can tell just how true that is, that he's doing the same darn show. Um, a, a, a quick acknowledgement, uh, the, the Johnny Carson interview and a number of the interviews in our program uh, were done by a, a guy named Arlo Grafton in the mid 80s. Uh, the three Omaha television stations were with it enough that uh, they did a, a joint uh, project together where they went out and they interviewed probably 30, 40 people who were there at the beginning. Um, some were kind of short, uh, uh, but they are, they are invaluable. And, and we would not have been able to do this program without, without Arlo's good work. Because you have Carson, you have, well, and, and literally before Arlo's project was complete, three of the people who he interviewed passed on as well. And uh, of the 40 interviews that he did, I think I counted maybe six people are still surviving now. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful resource and, and archive for us to, to have as well. Um, 
Channel 1011 that uh, uh, may, pr probably a lot of you guys grew up with is, is also a really fascinating story and very unusual in the, in the history of broadcasting nationally for a couple reasons. First of all, you may or not, may not know the story that uh, uh, how it came about and how it was the only station in Lincoln. In, uh, uh, in 1954, there were actually two television stations in Lincoln. There was KGOR television and there was KOLN television. KGOR started by the radio station. Uh, KOLN was started by a Michigan broadcaster and oddly enough, a poker buddy of my dad's in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, John Fetzer uh, uh, somehow saw that, that this Lincoln, Nebraska might be a pretty good market. Uh, he already had a, had a couple stations in uh, uh, farther east in the Midwest. And uh, so he came out here, got his broadcast license. Before this was illegal under federal broadcasting laws, John Fetzer went out, he bought the competition. He just went over and he bought KGOR. You could own two television stations at the time. You can again, you can own radio stations again. They've, they've loosened that back up again with deregulation. But it was, it was pretty good deal. He then proceeded to, out of the goodness of his heart, mm -hmm. donate then Channel 12 to the University of Nebraska because what a great opportunity for the people of Nebraska, which isn't a, I'm not going to argue with that, to have an educational television station. Free TV station for uh, the University of Nebraska, great. It becomes NET television. In the meantime, John Fetzer has a monopoly on the market. And they create a separate market from Omaha. A lot of other areas would have had one big market with Lincoln and Omaha at that time. By dividing the market, all of a sudden you have a whole different set of ad sales. You set your own rates. In the meantime, he and his general manager, who's also a broadcast engineer, go out and they create a thousand foot broadcast tower at Beaver Crossing. And they promote the heck out of this thing to the point where they are giving away television antennas to people. Put this on your house and you can watch. Attached to the television antenna were very helpful instructions on how to set it up and how to point the antenna away from Omaha <laughs> and over to Beaver Crossing. So everybody down here was watching Lincoln. They could have been, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been that hard to pick up the Omaha signal, but everybody's pointing their free antennas over this way. In the meantime, they also go out and they, they uh, create KGIN in Grand Island. So they create this huge supermarket that stretches all the way out to North Platte, and they keep that single market unbelievably until the mid-1980s, and they have a monopoly on this market. And as our good friend Lita Powell Drake points out in the documentary, it was a license to steal. <laughs> and I think we have her, her comment. She actually tells the story better, better than me, but uh, here's Lita number four. I thought television would never last. It was, it was so bad. Here were all these guys, remember women were not a part of television. Here are all these guys reading the news, the five minutes of news that was allowed, didn't go on the air until about four, four in the afternoon and the programs were atrocious. And I used to look through a rich neighbor's window who had a television set. And we'd look in there and everyone was very curious as to what it was. But I didn't have a television set at home. If by any chance any of you have in your basement photos or, please Lord, film of Lita Powell Drake as Calamity Kate, even Lita is trying to, is struggling with it. We may finally have a line on it. It's, it's one of our most frustrating sort of archival things. Is it, is it, there, there isn't very much of this, if anything, around anymore. 
Lee, as you know, ended up uh, uh, becoming a program manager at, at NET Television for uh, for some time as well, and and is in her own right a a broadcasting institution. Um, if you want to put the the slides up, I'm gonna I'm gonna just open it up to to questions here also, and we've just got still photos that we've that we've found over the years, and and I may go oh 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 stop 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 if there's if there's something really cool up there. Um, the, the, other, the other station that we probably need to address is KETV. They came, didn't come in until uh, the mid, mid-50s, 1957. Um, still nonetheless, a, uh, uh, still unusual for Omaha Taha to have, to have uh, three stations at the time. And uh, you see, I, I've lost you entirely now, haven't I? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even here. I could just start reciting the phone book and you're just gonna watch all this. You know, if, if you see something that you recognize with some of these still photos, uh, you may have actually, uh, may actually help us. The, the first few that I, that I can tell you was, the, uh, was one of the few. KMTV did none of this filming of, of television programs. Um, and so there's, there's almost no record of the early programs on KMTV. This is Betty Tolson, who was uh, the Martha Bolson of, of Channel 3. And uh, studio announcers may be the, the, the other kind of great lost item of, the, uh, uh, of, of that era of broadcasting. At the top of the hour, off camera, with a, usually a slide up, the station announcer would say, and you're watching WOW TV. They would also do up to 20 live commercials a night, or dur during, the, during their shift, both on camera and off. Uh, so it was, it, was a, a, it was a whole lot of work. Do any of you have any questions while we're watching these? Um, most of it was two camera work. Um, they were literally adding cameras as they, as they went along. The, the other, uh, and, and Channel 3, the other, the other kind of interesting history is Channel 3 ended up going to a full color station in 1955. This was a full 10 years before the networks began carrying a full color schedule. And uh, they were one of the few stations, uh, we, we haven't tracked down an actual number, but, but it was extremely rare that a station started going color that early. Other questions? Yeah. A KHAS. We were lucky. The weather was right. The 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 kind of growth in television in Nebraska past uh, uh, past Lincoln and Omaha is interesting too, because KHAS also was was a fairly early station, and then the Carlini family out in uh, North Platte uh, set up literally what remained one of the smallest markets in the country for a very long time. And uh, and the Carlinis are are still operated. It's it's owned by uh, uh, another chain now. But uh, uh, the 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 development of these other stations was again way ahead of the curve for a lot of other states. Uh, when you look at the television ownership figures that they had state by state breakdowns, uh, Omaha started out with maybe about 5,000 sets when television first went on the air. Within three years, there were over uh, 50,000 sets. Uh, it, it, it just exploded. And at the same time, there were 50,000 sets just in Omaha, and Lincoln was starting to, to come online. Um, the same chart shows South Dakota set ownership zero. <laughs> so, so Nebraska really was quite a bit ahead of the curve in, in television broadcasting. Um, you might recognize Nikita Khrushchev, uh, the, the then premier of Russia. Uh, KMTV sent a, uh, and boy, I wish we could include this in the show, but there's just, we're, we're cutting left and right as it is. Uh, KMTV did a full day live broadcast from the Garst family farm in Iowa where Khrushchev was visiting and ended up providing the feed nationally. The networks were literally interrupting program for uh, uh, since it was a big deal that a Soviet premier would be would be visiting the United States, 
Shameless alcohol plugs right in the middle of the news. Uh, when did national syndication start? When did the, feeds? The, the feeds finally did start in 1952. Um, and, and that literally was the beginning of the end of a lot of the local programming. When you start adding to that, they would still have the afternoon programs and the like. Almost all evening local programming disappeared immediately. The afternoon programming started fading away as the soap operas started showing up. And as more and more material was not only uh, presented by the networks, but also entered syndication where you know, something like Oprah is not produced by a network, it's produced by a, by a private distributor that chops it out to individual stations. And the more lucrative that became, the less and less local programming there was, and that's where sponsors wanted to put their money. So, very good question, thank you. Bill, when can we expect to see uh, this program? Thank you. <laughs> what a great question. Thank you, Paul. You can see the question. Actually, the program was, was, your, was originally, and it's part of the reason this, this was scheduled when it was, it was supposed to be, be airing this month. We've decided to hold off until uh, August. This is going to be one of those public television membership drive programs. And uh, uh, so it'll, be, it'll actually be airing in August. We hope to actually have a couple of premiere events, one here in Lincoln and, and one in Omaha that uh, uh, we'd like to have the public invited to as well. Um, but uh, uh, stay tuned, because it'll, be, uh, it'll air in August. Um, something that uh, Ethel Doherty was the, uh, one of the first non-women's no, it was one of the first women's show that wasn't a cooking show. And she actually did exercises on the air. And we haven't, uh, it's, unfortunately this may be another <coughs> editing cut because we're not still quite at the hour. Uh, but uh, Ethel may have had one of, if not the first exercise program on television. Uh, we, we, I, I haven't found anything else that was, that was earlier than her program. She was a dance teacher and was watching television and said, well, how come they don't have any exercise programs on? And went down to WOW and said, how come you aren't doing exercise programs? And they go, well, why would we do that? <laughs> and, and she said, well, you, do you want to do the program? And she said, well, I guess. They said, you ever been in a TV station? No. You ever done a script before? No. That, and the other question was, was great. They said, well, what would you wear? Something skimpy? <laughs> and she said, no, we'd wear pants, you know, the, the little, uh, oh, what are the, what are the ankle pants? Capri pants, thank you. Um, and, and they ended up putting, and it was, and it was incredibly successful. She, uh, she ended up doing it on two different stations over the years. Um, and an awful lot, it's the, the hardest part of this program. It's always difficult figuring out what have you got to leave behind. But, but more and more as Jim and I have gone through this process, it's like, oh God, I hate giving that up. I hate giving that up. Um, and I may, because we're almost out of time, aren't we? Um, I'll, I'll leave you with, with my, oh yeah, take a question up here before we go. And that's, that's, a, that's a really good point, that after all these years, people can still sing their advertising slogans from the 1950s. You still remember Bob Hildebrand. He hasn't been on for, for 100 years. I can, I can still sing the Ham's Blue Ribbon beer commercial that this seven-year-old had uh, memorized at the time. And, and it's, it's fascinating just how deep the, the, the memories are for people that watched it, in part because things stayed on television longer and, and the personalities were so vivid, but that's all we had to watch as well. Uh, a, a closing anecdote that isn't anywhere near going to get in the program, but it's, it's one of my favorites. A guy named Cal Kirshen, who did a lot of live commercials, 
tells a story about one of his colleagues uh, doing a, a show during their afternoon kids show. And uh, the, the sponsor was Bosco, which was the uh, chocolate flavored drink. And uh, they literally gave these guys, they didn't give them a script. They just literally had to come up with a, with a different shtick every time. And, and so they were always just coming up with stuff. And the and, uh, guy said, okay, okay, I got this great idea. You know, we got the counter here and we got the product and, and all that. You know, I'm just going to pop out and, and tell the kids to, uh, you know, to buy Bosco. And, and, and they come up and the table's empty and he pops up and he goes, Hey, kids, I've just been down there playing with my Bosco, and I want you to... <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was live. <laughs> but what's tragic is it's not on film or tape or anything. So there, were, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of wonderful anecdotes from the people who were involved in television at that time. Uh, it's, it's been such a pleasure. My thanks to Paul Eisloffel and the State Historical Society, not just for, for having, having us down here today, but thank goodness that they're taking the time to preserve this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful film. And uh, uh, boy, I look forward to, to just continuing to, to mine your resources for, for other projects in the future. So thank you all for coming out today. <laughs>